it when they do check, I come from Slovenia and I'm a part of the trace team, uh, the project that we will hear more about tomorrow. Uh, but now it's time for one of the other co-organizers of the event, uh, Project Remember. Here we have uh, the principal uh, investigator, Anna Kristina Santos, uh, uh, and the team members, Anna Lucia Santos and Mara Pie. Um, yes, I will leave you guys to... Thank you very much, uh, uh, Anche, and thank you to everyone to, for being here on time after what was a very long uh, hour for lunch uh, according to other country standards. For Portugal it's quite common to have one hour and a half. So I hope you were able to enjoy it and take some sun and everything. So um, before I um, go straight into my presentation, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the research project Remember, uh, which is, as my colleague said, one of the two projects organizing this event. Um, and the project Remember, recording experiences of LGBTQ uh, elders in post dictatorship Portugal, uh, started in 2022 and was supposed to last for two years, but we recently received the good news from our funding agency that we got an extension for another yeah. six months. <laughs> so that's good. We will finish it only in June uh, 2025. Um, and so, yeah, it was funded by the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology. Um, and there's a, a team of researchers uh, who will, I will present shortly. But basically, um, the idea with this project was to um, try to understand a bit about the, the impact of uh, legal change and cultural change in the lives of uh, older LGBTQI people in the Portuguese context. So in the slide, you can see that uh, Portugal has been scoring not too poorly, according to the um, Ilga Europe framework map, which is always, every year is updated. So there was a time in which Portugal uh, scored higher, I must confess. So we were dropping a few points uh, because of several uh, reasons. And one of them has had to do with uh, how late we were with uh, banning so-called conversion therapy. So you can see that only happened last year. Uh, but there were other uh, problems involved. But the important thing here to say is that um, we had the, the transition for democracy in 1974, and then for um, eight years of democracy, it was still a crime to be, um, yeah, to, to love someone uh, who you love or to be who you love, uh, unless you were a cis um, person. Uh, and then for another almost 20 years, there was nothing in terms of legal change in the Portuguese context. So the first uh, real change came already in the 21st century with the de facto unions. And after that, things sort of uh, split up a bit compared to the, what had happened uh, before. Okay, so this is the moment when we pause and think. What does it mean for an older queer who was born a criminal? and then survived the AIDS crisis, to arrive in 2024 and have all of these rights on paper, those rights we just saw. In which ways do these policies match the expectations and experiences of older LGBTQI people? Have they arrived too late? How do people feel about it? And what can we, as scholars, as activists, as stakeholders, do about it? So that was uh, our point of departure, that perplexity, that need to understand uh, what all of those changes meant on the daily basis of our older queers in the Portuguese context. And that's how the project, uh, remember, uh, emerged. So you see in the slides uh, the team of researchers. Uh, those of you paying more attention to faces will recognize Miguel Gardina, who was in the opening session. He's part of the team as an historian. Um, Pablo Pérez Navarro, who was here in the morning, can't see now. Uh, Tiago Cris Marques, um, Ana Lucy Santos, Mara Pieri, and myself. Okay. So, 
Often people are curious about that to set, so I'll take that out of the way immediately to say that what we set ourselves to do was to conduct 15 green interviews. I'm super happy and actually super enthusiastic to speak about the method if you're curious about it in the Q&A. Uh, but they're basically narrative interviews, so uh, we take long hours with each participant, that's why we decided to have only 15. And then we were also using 10 semi-structured interviews from the previous project I, in which I was co-PI with Andrew King, who was the, the keynote in the morning. And we do all sorts of uh, cool things with, with this data. Uh, the usual stuff, not so cool, so it's like an article from articles, you know, applications of this, that, and talks, and comments, But we also go to schools, and we're very, very passionate about this. So we have this session uh, which translates like rainbow grannies or you know rainbow grandparents, whatever you want to call it. Um, and basically this session is prepared for kids between uh, 12 to 16, we adjust it. And um, so yeah, we go there and just say, you know, not all grandparents are straight. Yeah, and then we take it from there. And they're super, super curious. They're also about, they are very curious to know about ourselves, the, the people who go there to, to give the talk. And this is a, a team of well, maybe six of us uh, go in turns to schools to, to give this, uh, this talk. Okay, so now we go straight to the, the paper. And some of the things I'll be saying, they were already published um, and you have the references there. So from the... Um, the interviews we conducted, uh, some of the things that emerged um, were related to um, sort of the saddest side of aging as an LGBTQ person. So things to do with mental health, with hate speech, bullying, with violence, health problems, you know, all the things you have there in that sort of uh, time um, instrument. The name of which in English uh, escapes me now? Hour. An hourglass. I'll trust you on that one. <laughs> so, uh, thank you to the Portuguese speaker in the room. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, the idea here was to try to think how these um, uh, narratives have changed also uh, over time. So, I'll be speaking a little bit about these aspects, but I want to spend quite a lot of time in the 15 minutes I got, <laughs> uh, speaking about uh, joy and pride. So just bear with me in this part of the talk. So some of the things that emerge from data are related to uh, social stigma, to loneliness, to, to healthcare. Um, as you would expect, um, given the premise in the beginning talk that we're speaking about a generation that has survived uh, the criminalization, then survived the AIDS-related stigma, arriving to the 21st century with all of these different rights being um, granted, at least on paper, formal rights. Um, so we do have a lot uh, that has been said by our uh, participants on stigma uh, related to HIV and after also about loneliness, um, this uh, feeling of not being able, not feeling, the actual um, material reality of not being able to um, count, to, to draw on your biological family because the ties have been cut um, in the past, or the feeling of being invisible in terms of uh, their erotic personas, or going to bars, or going to Places of socialization and feeling they're not the object of desire anymore, and how you know that changes over time. Um, other people mentioned the succession of uh, ephemeral encounters instead of relationships, and how that characterized much of their youth and their um, as they were growing up. And some of this was obviously um, much, uh, you know, it was a, it was a wanted, uh, ephemeral encounter, but 
Sometimes it was not the case. It was just part of what was available at the time. Because a relationship would imply a much more visibility, therefore exposing people to an increasing risk. So one of the people I in, one of the persons I interviewed, uh, of course all the names are um, anonymized and we, we never give the actual uh, age, we always speak about age groups also to um, promote uh, confidentiality. So Manuel, a gay man in the 60s, he said, you know, when you're young, everything is forgiven, but when you're old, all the people are seen in a certain way. Look at those, so old, and they haven't been cured yet. Now, mind you that this uh, uh, interview was not conducted 20 years ago. And this uh, uh, person was referring to something that actually happened to him while he was holding hands with his uh, life partner um, in, a, in a place in Lisbon in daylight. So in terms of, of healthcare, I'm not going to spend much time on this, um, partly because we will have uh, the, final, the final presentation of this plenary uh, will be uh, exclusively dedicated to healthcare. But in brief, people mention scarce sources of care, networks of care, uh, often uh, too attached to the partner, in the cases there is a partner. Um, the feeling of not belonging to a community, so Agnes, I, uh, in your talk, um, earlier on in the, the parallel session, there was there was uh, your amazing work on Ireland when people felt part of the community, and I was thinking how different it is from from the Portuguese participants. And what they were saying was that uh, you know it's not for us because the the way activism is built is based on an assumption of um, mobility. You know, being able to, to go to the main places where events take place, where meetings take place, it implies money, it implies logistics, it implies I need to park, it's just too much hassle, I can't be bothered, you know, it's not for me. Or I go there and there's no one else uh, as old as I am, and you know, I just feel ignored or unseen. Uh, and like other countries, in Portugal, we do not have uh, proud seniors. Who are the Greeks? Where are the Greeks? They're not here. Oh, we, now we all know that the Greeks missed this session. <laughs> <laughs> so in Greece, there's this amazing organization called Proud Seniors. You'll hear about it because they're going to speak tomorrow. Or in Spain, you also have a Fundación uh, in this case. In Spain. In Spain. Very proud. I wanted to say it in Spanish. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, we don't have it. Um, also, people I interviewed, they, uh, they had very few end-of-life plans. So we think it's to, uh, you know, the universe will take care of me. Um, why would it? You know, everything will be fine. I'm not there yet. I, I feel, you know, I'm feeling pretty okay myself. Okay. Um, but there was some concern about uh, health provision. Okay, so this is the part I want to spend a bit more time um, on, which is the idea of pure joy as an act of resistance. Yes, we can. So I started noticing also because in the same structured interviews we would at some point ask people, you know, tell me something. That, uh, it, that it's like something good, something amazing about being a gay man, a man your age that was not there two years ago, or uh, yeah, a trans woman your age, whatever, you just adapted. Um, but tell me something good that was not there before. And, and so these are some of the things we got from, from that provocation, that probe. So Pedro says, I'm more sure of myself. I think I appreciate things more, you know. I have another type of freedom that I didn't have. The freedom to say no. Which is huge, you would say. The ability to say no to things is very important. So deeply, I feel happier, you know. Vera, in her late 60s, says a very positive thing. 
is to do what I want and when I want. So we carry on a little bit along these lines, also with Annabelle, um, her early 60s. She said, in the meantime, I went and did what I wanted. I went to study serendipity, which I find a beautiful uh, you know, wording to describe what she was doing. I went to study serendipity, which I'm still doing today. I've been doing that for years, enrolling in all the things that I felt like doing and I really wanted. I don't have any problems with my old age in the sense that I always do, which is what am I going to do when I retire or whatever? Because I'm already doing lots of things, activities. I'm going to a retreat this weekend. I'm going away to organize a retreat, uh, volunteer classes in institutions, meditation, uh, meditation, put some frap, you know, everything. It goes on and on and on. She even says, I find it difficult to have free time to read. <laughs> But there was also something to be said about that aspect I told you earlier, people feeling invisible in terms of their erotic persona. So Jessica, a trans uh, person uh, in her late 60s, she says, eroticism and desire, passions, interests have increased twofold since my surgery. I'm on a honeymoon with my body. <laughs> There was a phase when I masturbated twice a day in front of my body, so I'm living a late adolescent phase, authentically. I want to experiment. I want everything I didn't do as a youngster. I'm now doing with men, with women, with couples, and she went on and on. Okay? So this person, um, she uh, you know, found the, uh, the resources to be who she is later in life. So, uh, not when she was a, a young person, and uh, I find this excerpt uh, really beautiful and empowering. We'll carry on a bit more. Miriam says, I think that being lesbian, gay, trans, or bi already forces us to think a little outside the norm. I think that's a great opportunity. The fact of uh, leaving, having a different experience, alerts us to the and I have patience. There's a natural resilience in people who face a lot of setbacks. And you get used to it, and you get used to having patience, and you get used to having five minutes of despair, and then you move on, don't you? And I think that's a plus. I think this is the type of narrative we don't often uh, hear about, or we don't pay too much attention, because we're so much focused on things we need to solve that we forget to acknowledge things that have been already gained, not in, from the point of view of laws, but from the point of view of empowerment and resistance. And we need more of this. So again, I want you to do what of Agnes. I just say goodbye to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> because they want these amazing things. <laughs> just left, that's why I'm so again. We'll carry on. So, to, to, reaching the end very fast, There's also uh, this tension uh, that we need to, uh, again, acknowledge. Is that joy does not come without, necessarily, without pain or, or loss. They're not, it doesn't mean that for you to, to enjoy uh, being an older queer person, you must have had it easy throughout your life. It's not the way it works. So often happiness and unhappiness become intimate partners. Um, and I want you to pay very close attention to the next one, which is a, a large one. Rita Trans, in her early 60s, she said, as I have two uh, generative diseases, I know that death could have already knocked on my door, and I know that I have the privilege of still being here. I managed to survive everything that life gave me, everything that life threw at me. I managed to survive. I was always privileged in life, even when I was involved. Even when I was involved in drugs, I was always privileged. Even in times of rape, I was always privileged. I have always, always managed to survive everything. Within my unhappiness, I am happy, and I thank life every day for the opportunity that life gives me because I'm still here. I should have died many years ago. I'm still here. I fought to be who I am. I am proud to be who I am. 
Even though I hurt inside, I am happy to be who I am because it took a lot of tears, sweat, and blood. And I don't think I should uh, try to interpret what's in here because for each one of us, this will uh, touch different parts. But uh, I, yeah, uh, we need to take these words and, and, um, and understand what's being said here and not dismiss it as a terrible, terrible story or a privileged story, although she repeats the word privilege so much. Okay. So, surviving. The verb has as many meanings as nuances. Enduring, persisting, remaining. Older LGBTQI people are those who persisted against all odds. When the world built up walls of hate speech and shame, they shout louder and walked prouder. When words fail, queer aging bodies remain as powerful reminders of the right to be, unashamed and unapologetic. Their embodied memories constitute a precious legacy, and as such offer unreplaceable insights for new and adequate policies on diversity, sexuality and aging. Thank you very much. So, building on the previous presentation about the Millennial Project, I will now share some uh, findings and thoughts uh, by presenting four case studies. <coughs> My coach is based on the idea that the body serves not only just not only as a biological fact or a biological process, but also as a living archive as conceptualized by Paul Preciado. These bodies are archives. They contain personal and collective histories accumulated over more than 60 years. We accept the persons that I'm bringing here are more than 60 years, shaping both individual and collective identities over time. Okay. <laughs> During childhood and youth years, the fear of legal consequences and societal rejection forces many queer people to live much of their lives in the closet, leaving their lives silenced and resulting in long lasting effects on mental health and emotional well being. As they enter into life, this period can be both liberating and frightening, as it often involves confronting new established societal norms and personal relationships. In older age, the lifetime of marginalization can create unique vulnerabilities. And this is special true for those who remain closet for much of their lives or lack like a supportive community. But age can also emerge as a liberating factor, allowing them to seek fulfillment in ways that may have previously, previously suppressed, including the certain boundaries and distancing themselves from those who exhibit discriminatory attitudes. And I will start by presenting two case studies, placing side by side Jessica and Rita, that were already mentioned, but I will uh, go deeper uh, on their stories. So, Rita is a lower middle class woman who sees an early age in place her female gender identity, and Jessica, on the other hand, is an upper middle class woman who embraces her gender identity much later in life during her 60s. Starting with Jessica, Jessica reflects on her early experiences of feeling different. At school, she observed that boys behave in unfamiliar ways, provoking feelings of not belonging. In an effort to fit in, Jessica began to construct an image that aligned with the societal expectations of what a teenage boy could be or should be. And she shared, she shared with us about it. I felt different and lived in constant fear of being exposed. I began to notice that boys said in a certain way that wasn't like mine, that they walked in a particular manner that was not like mine, and that they spoke in a way that was not like mine. This led me to construct an image that conformed to the idea of what the teenage boy is supposed to be. Going through uh, puberty immersed in toxic masculinity, made Jessica adopt a performance that allowed her to pass as a man without any trace of femininity. For most of her life, 
the sense of not belonging to the scene's heteronormative expectations was Jessica in various situations of anxiety and depression. She attempted to, later in life, she attempted to address the issue of gender identity with different psychologists, but they were always convinced to not to think about that since it would only bring her more trouble. But at 60, she finally met a psychologist, welcomed her, and supported her in the process of exploring her gender identity, and she immediately started the gender affirmation process. And she shares that after gender affirmation, my feelings of eroticism, desire, and passion have grown immensely. The mirrors in my home have become worn out because each time I gaze at my reflection, I finally see the person I was meant to be. The failure to conform to a cis performance and the acceptance of an unemployment gender identity have not resulted in physical and psychological well-being never experienced before. In an era of an overemphasis on successful aging, the active, healthy, heteronormative, trans people propose a new form of success. And Jessica embodies this new configuration. She complied with the heteronormative script in the past. She, she, she was married, she had children, she had a wealthy life, but only now she's living a fulfilling life for the first time. This snapshot of Jessica illustrates our acceptance, professional support, and the opportunity to live according to one's gender identity can have a transformative impact on the lives of trans people, regardless of the age at which they begin their gender affirmation process. Okay, now Rita, unlike Jessica, Rita lived most of her life as a socially recognized woman. From an early age, she fought to be recognized as such. Not only she did this her gender identity in her youth, she also underwent aesthetic bodily modifications that are now considered precarious, but that were the only options available in the 80s. The use of substances such as industrial silicone was widespread among trans women, and Rita was one of its users. Although the substance produces the desired effect when applied to the body, adverse side effects tend to emerge later in life, and the long-term consequences can include the migration of silicone inside the body or the presence of dark patches in the skin. And now, reflecting on aging, Rita tells us, I was not born a woman. I made myself a woman. To make myself a woman, I had to undergo numerous physical changes to eliminate the masculine traits I had. I used to be quite pretty. Now, when I look in the mirror, I see my face all good. Even though I'm hurting inside, I'm happy to be who I am because it was a lot at the cost of at the cost of a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Rita's story is a powerful reflection on the complexities that arise from the intersection of gender identity, societal expectations, and the passage of time. As she reflects on her journey, Rita states. I was not born a woman, I made myself a woman. And this echoes Simone de Beauvoir, famous assertion of what is not born a woman, but better becomes one. Rita's story is a reminder of the Beauvoir insights into the construction of gender identity and the impact of social expectations on personal fulfillment, on one hand, and on living a livable life, as Butler would say, on the other hand. Rita embodies an archive of resilience, resistance, and personal affirmation. Her story challenges us to consider how gender norm norms shape our experiences in our bodies and reflect how we might create spaces where we can achieve a sense of self that is authentic and free from social constraints, constraints including aesthetical expectations. Uh, now I will, I will move to present the life stories of two cisgender gay men. Uh, and a key, a key factor influencing how individuals live their sexual identity later in life seems to, to be how they have lived their sexual identity in their younger years. I will start with Leandro. Leandro 
and what is the example of our life of concealment impacts later in life. He starts the interview by stating that this is the beginning of the interview. My actions throughout life were shaped by the, ex the experiences I had. It was crucial for me to understand that people, what people thought about this issue, this issue of homosexuality, so that I could navigate among them. I grew up in a very typical lower middle class family where prejudice and views on homosexuality were equivalent to shame, perversion, something unnatural. So, even though I was more of a different, I began to realize that this was something I couldn't, or rather, that it wouldn't be advisable for me to redeem. So, having grew up in such an environment for a long period, pressed uh, Leandro to conform to traditional views of heterosexuality. Let's pay attention to what he has to say about his own blessed romantic relationship. He says that we have been together, uh, so to speak, for 20 years, but no one in my family knows. My friends, my colleagues don't know. His family doesn't know either. We are so influenced by the dominant culture that even though I'm married to a man and could refer to him as husband, I still find it difficult to use this term, husband. I don't think it sounds right. So despite being in a long-term relationship, we are looked as chosen, chosen, to keep it hidden from everyone. This secrecy reflects the internal conflict between his personal identity and social acceptance. The difficulty in using the term husband underscores the psychological impact that they look in the internalized stigma of living in a culture where non-normative identities have a long tradition of marginalization. Now, Renato. Renato has a totally different experience. Um, although having grown up in a rigid, heterosexual environment where stereotypes about homosexuality prevailed, and he did not fit in those stereotypes, he found in Amsterdam a queer space that was a promise of a safe space. And he said, I moved to Amsterdam because I read, I read a newspaper article about the gay community there. I found, some, I found something great in the article. It said that in Amsterdam, there were gay people, there were lawyers, doctors, athletes, musicians, everything. It wasn't necessary to fit into a box set by others. I could be whoever I wanted to be. By rotating, Renat was able to explore his sexuality, and this was a turning point transition, since he never felt like he to the closet again. And moving forward to present days, he speaks about the importance of setting personal boundaries. And Renato says, when someone doesn't treat me well, I give them a second chance and say, look, things need to change. If they continue to treat me poorly, I stop talking to them. Several times in my life, I've written to people saying, I hope you have a good life, but I would appreciate it if you never contact me again. This includes family members and former friends. In the time I have left, I want to spend it with wonderful people. This approach of this Renato, this approach of Renato can be understood through the lens of queer resilience where individuals, particularly those who have faced marginalization, develop strategies to protect their work, their well-being. Renato's willingness of spending his remaining time with wonderful people reflects a conscious effort to cultivate a supportive and affirming social environment. Example finding a clear temporality that values good personal relationships of choice instead of social conventions. Okay, now to wrap up. <coughs> um, I have some key insights from these case studies. Um, certainly, the age, the age of the experience, including its very definition, is subjective and I would dare to propose one. Charlotte Ponte at 30 declared that her life was over. The United States suggests that the psychological and the psychosocial costs of traumatic experiences combined, combined with malnutrition and exposure to disease can, create, can cause people to age faster than others. 
our interview Rita, for instance, uh, she told me that uh, she believed that trans people age faster than, than cisgender people. Well, on the other hand, Jessica said that she's living in her adolescence now. So this is a very uh, subjective experience. Um, and this also highlights our perceptions of age and severity can differ uh, can differ across individuals and also across contexts. The aging process is not only a biological process, it is a cumulative process of oppressions and resistances in a fragmented body somatech as Preciado would say somatech. If the biological body measures aging by the number of wrinkles, the somatech body, body or the archive, the living archive body measures the density of the political archival discourses, pharmacotechnologies, decades of stigma, type of sin and disease, but also of resistance, creativity, culminating with a clear art of failure, as advocated by Augustine, or a glitch in the binary codes of the cis heterosexual script, as conceptualized by Jamie Sunday and performed by Jessica. The narratives of these people have centered uh, were centered on the, on the journey of self-discovery and uh, gender authenticity or gender euphoria as it is understood as a deep sense of joy and affirmation that arises when individuals experience uh, gender identity aligning with self-perception and with experience. These perspectives can help broaden conventional concepts, concepts of successful aging and temporality concepts that we frequently encounter in the mainstream aging studies. The management of sexual identity in youth years seems to contribute to positive or negative experiences regarding, gender, regarding sexual identity, as we saw, for instance, in Rianu and in other stories. But as queer people age in the post retirement, they enter a new phase of life where they can feel they owe nothing to no one and they can live their sexuality more freely and more authentically. After a life marked by the stigma of crimes, crime scene and disease, retirement, retirement allows for the possibility of a more liberated, uh, liberated life, as exemplified, for instance, by Jessica. The support of health professionals and uh, the opportunity to live in alignment with one's gender identity can have a transformative impact on the lives of trans people regardless of the age at which they begin their affirmation uh, journey. Um, but on these regards, on the health uh, semantic, on the health topic, my colleague Mara will have uh, deeper into this topic. Um, yes, I, I, I have some readings. Um, and forthcoming, uh, my book chapter on our book my book chapter on the book edited by the Christina Center to the Center Gender for Sexual Aging, uh, probably in 2025. Uh, you can read more about this topic. And thank you so much. Good afternoon. Um, I'm also speaking as a member of the team in the project Remember. Uh, but um, whilst my, my, my colleagues here before me have spoken about how important it is to retrieve the past and to create archives of memory to honor the lives of LGBTQ plus people. And in this presentation today, I will focus more on the present and on the future of the people that today are aging. And I will focus especially on health as a central issue um, as a central focus point of analysis and I will present to you a toolkit that we developed within the project. The toolkit is this and I will make it circulate. This is the Portuguese version so uh, I'm sorry that no Portuguese speaking people will not understand it but we are going to release uh, an English version soon online so so when we address the issue uh, of healthcare in LGBTQ plus people uh, aging population, we face uh, two major challenges. The first one is the fact that uh, uh, LGBTQ plus people are invisible, mostly invisible, within the large amount of aging population. So to put it simply, we 
don't know how many they are, so we don't know how old they are. Portugal has one of the oldest populations in Europe in terms of uh, life expectations and in terms of percentage of older people. So there's this data released by the United Nations in 2023 that shows that 23.4% of the Portuguese population is 65 plus. Mm -hmm. so this amounts to around 2 million people. Uh, so we can draw an esteem of at least 230,000 LGBTQ plus people in the country who are actually right now uh, uh, aged 65 plus. It's an esteem. However, research, presentation, social discourse on the experiences of these people are scarce and produce the false impression that the aging population is big but is not really diverse within. And in other words, that there are not LGBTQ plus people um, over 65. And when they are, they fall outside the imperative of successful aging. So LGBTQ plus aging people are systematically written out of narratives, of policies, of intervention that promote uh, successful aging, active aging, and so on. And so their possible future is mostly rendered invisible, therefore unworthy. The second uh, challenge that we encounter is the fact that um, health, the LGBTQ plus health during aging tends to be poorer. It means that research on health in the aging population shows that the population aged 65 plus is generally more exposed to health issues, like a higher incidence of multiple chronic illnesses, disability, loss of autonomy, mental health issues, dementia, uh, some of us in the room are working on some of these issues and are presenting, have presented this morning or will present uh, afterwards on these issues. So we all know that uh, from the literature. Um, we also know from literature that uh, um, LGBTQ plus experiences uh, implies higher vulnerability in, um, in other aspects. The fact that stigma, discrimination, social exclusion combined with factors like economic vulnerability often cause a higher incidence of chronic illnesses, of mental health issues, and uh, misuse of substances, and so on. And so, in this sense, there are three aspects that are particularly important. The first is the tendency uh, to be more isolated and to have scarce networks of care. Uh, and this, of course, has an impact, uh, a negative impact on mental and physical health. The second uh, element is that the accumulation of trauma, of discrimination, and the long experience of exclusion has a consequence on the overall well-being. So research shows, for example, that the LGBTQ plus population may show a pronounced tendency to uh, abuse of alcohol, tobacco, drugs, use of depressants or develop chronic illnesses. And also, trans and non-white people is particularly exposed to health-related issues and uh, a general shorter life, shorter life expectancy, <coughs> as my colleagues have also showed. And the third element is that uh, healthcare professionals are largely unprepared to treat LGBTQ plus patients especially in later life. In Portugal, as it happens in many other countries, there is no specific training on LGBTQ plus issues in any healthcare curriculum. So the lack of preparation and the absence of guidelines exposes LGBTQ plus patients to discrimination, to unjust treatment, and also to a sort of uh, fear to access healthcare services. So considering this general context, we consider it important to bring together the knowledge collected through our interviews and the data existing in literature to produce a resource that could impact the present to create a different future, to write a different future. For those who are aging today, but also those that will be hopefully aging tomorrow. And this is a... Uh, uh, what uh, happened, this is what we produced, is a, it's a research called uh, Aging as LGBTQ Plus in Portugal, a guide for health professionals and carers. 
Uh, it is a toolkit uh, right now, as I said, available for the printed and digital version in Portugal and will be soon released in uh, English. So what we suggest is that you keep uh, posted. How do you say, yeah? You keep posted with what you do and uh, <laughs> stay tuned, exactly. <laughs> and uh, uh, follow the, the, the next steps. So we considered it uh, crucial to shape this toolkit according to the experiences and suggestions that emerged during the interviews, from a, not from a top, uh, uh, from a top, top down uh, prospect, but uh, from a bottom up prospect. Because although health and access to healthcare was were not in the central focus of the interview, participants very often spoke about these topics as relevant in their daily life. And also our aim was not to provide a technical description of the do's and don'ts of practicing healthcare with aging LGBTQ plus people. On the contrary, we were invested in encouraging a process where the center was always on the LGBTQ plus people's voices, their needs, their claims, their life stories. So, the steps were uh, all started with interviews. Um, I will not uh, stop much uh, on, on the interviews because uh, you already had a, quite a picture of that. But uh, we identified a set of issues relating to health and healthcare that were relevant to address healthcare audience. We also compared the <laughs> we also compared the, the topics with the literature and with other toolkits that were produced in other contexts. As you can see here, they, they are especially uh, toolkits that were produced in the North American context and the, in the UK and in other countries. And then, um, as, as you can imagine, there are some topics that are very much the product of the Portuguese context, its history, its culture, whilst others are reflected generally. And so this uh, process of uh, identifying other toolkits toolkits uh, was really important to, to set some of the differences and, and to check where we were in the, in the debate. And then we proceeded in constructing the, the toolkit. Um, so from uh, at the beginning we thought it would be addressed only to healthcare providers, but then the interviews showed that, that the network of people that actually take care of aging people's health is way broader than just healthcare providers. Many mentioned, for example, the centrality of informal carers, such as partners, friends, neighbors, in assisting them in health-related activities, like going to the pharmacy, assist, uh, providing therapies, accessing hospitals, and so on. And so we decided to sort of broaden the, the audience of our toolkit to address the array of figures that uh, compose this network of care. Um, the first objective of the toolkit is producing knowledge. And uh, it is a way of producing knowledge from the experiences that we collected. So the toolkit is structured around excerpts of interviews that create the frame to inform and to present facts. Uh, in, this example, for example, in this example, we first read the, the experience uh, uh, of Nato, a cis gay man, when he says, and I quote, Medical doctors and nurses were afraid of patients with AIDS. Several friends abandoned me because they were afraid of AIDS. I myself thought that maybe I was going to die young, end of quote. This story is part of another story, serves as a beginning for us in the toolkit to explain how cumulative trauma works, how it influences the relationship between older LGBTQ plus people and the healthcare system what these people experienced in the past, in this case during the AIDS pandemic, and how this needs to be taken into account when structuring care uh, in the present. The second aim of the, of the toolkit is providing recommendations. Uh, recommendations that are very practice-oriented and that encourage uh, readers to take action in healthcare settings and care homes, and that uh, suggests also small steps in the acknowledgement that sometimes small steps uh, are better than no steps at all. So we focused on seven areas, uh, such as awareness about myths and prejudices, uh, creating safe and accessible environments, 
organizing LGBTQ plus themed uh, events, uh, enhancing uh, training to professionals. And again, also in setting out these recommendations, the voice of participants uh, guided us uh, through the design of this part. Uh, and it is well represented in what Annabella, a lesbian cis woman, states. Uh, and I quote, there are a number of issues on which there is still a lot that can be done and should be done. Now, the ideal may be almost impossible, but if we don't look to the horizon and walk towards that direction, we don't go any further. And we must always want the impossible. That's the way to go as far as possible. Um, end of quote. So, the voice of Annabella reminds us once more that the future is still very much present, in aging uh, people vocabulary, and so is their will and capacity to think about tomorrow and to fight the right battles, to be self-determined. Of course, there are also some challenges that uh, we always face whenever we produce a resource uh, like that. Uh, the toolkit was released and distributed only three months ago, so we cannot evaluate yet its impact and the changes it hopefully generated. Inevitably, though, it is important to reflect on the process and on the challenges it implies. And uh, this is a reflection that we want to share with you because uh, we may uh, also have uh, uh, important conversations about the different contexts and different experiences you may have in your, in your countries. So, of course, there is the first challenge is how do we make sure that the toolkit is implemented? How do we do the monitoring in the present and in the future? But also, uh, something that came up during the production of this toolkit was, would it make sense to imagine different toolkits for different uh, healthcare providers, for example, gerontologists and uh, psychologists and uh, endocrinologists, or, for example, for different communities, addressing different communities within the broad LGBTQ plus uh, umbrella, which is uh, really broad. For example, addressing only trans and non-binary issues, and how should we make uh, the information accessible, reliable, and especially timely in the future beyond the, our national context? Because things, things are constantly evolving, and we have a very uh, a proof of that also with this toolkit. In the Portuguese version, we wrote that uh, uh, some treatments were not uh, available in the country for trans uh, people, uh, especially access to, um, to some sort of um, um, screenings. And in the meantime, like uh, two weeks after we launched the, the toolkit, the law changed. So in the, in the English version, this uh, will have to be corrected. And, and this, uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, something that has to do also in the way we, we want to rewrite the future, but we also need to make uh, resources that are uh, to follow the changes, that are up, uh, to up for updates. Uh, so, and concluding, this uh, interdisciplinary process unveils uh, a lot of potential in transforming the practices of healthcare uh, because it brings to the center uh, of, the, of the change the very subjects that have long been silenced and been, uh, been made invisible. And in this sense, this, uh, the creation of this toolkit or the creation of, of a toolkit can become a process of change in healthcare practices one that sprouts from dialogues, but also from an effort to construct different views of aging. Views that are not centered on victimization or vulnerability only, but also that retrieve the centrality of the aging population as self-determined and willing to decide on their own health and bodies. Thank you.